This had on American Black Journal, one of the highest ranking African Americans in the auto industry, GM Vice President Ed Welburn, talks about his career and breaking racial barriers in corporate America. Plus, the Michigan Veterans Foundation breaks ground on a new facility to help homeless veterans. Don't go away. American Black Journal starts now. American Black Journal is funded by the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, a partner with communities where children come first. At DTE Energy, we believe that we have a greater responsibility. We believe that being part of a community means being involved in the fabric of that community, investing time, effort, and resources in the communities we serve. DTE Energy Foundation is a proud sponsor of American Black Journal. Welcome to American Black Journal, I'm Stephen Henderson. General Motors Vice President Ed Welburn made history in 2005 when he became the first African American to lead a global design team in the auto industry. Now, some 44 years after he joined GM, Welburn is going to retire on July 1st. As global design chief, he built a network of 10 design centers and a team of more than 2,500 men and women in seven countries. Throughout his career, Welburn has won dozens of prestigious awards, including a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Detroit Free Press. And GM rededicated its Center for African American Art at the Detroit Institute of Arts in his honor. American Black Journal contributor Marlo Stoudemire sat down with Welburn to talk about his history-making career. Welcome to American Black Journal, Ed. How are you? I'm doing great. It's great to be here. Good, good. Thanks for coming on the show. You know, a lot of people want to know how you became interested in a career in the auto industry, especially in design. Well, I think that trigger, that inspiration came at a very early age. Yeah. I mean, I've been drawing cars since I was like two and a half and cars were around me. My father had an auto repair shop, and I think that's where the trigger came from. That's awesome, that's awesome. You know, with that trigger, talk about the trajectory of your career, like from the beginning, key milestones, points that really had some inspiration for you, but more than anything, lessons learned to get you to where you are today. Well, it's been quite a journey. It's been a, a fun journey, but um, like I said, I was crazy <laughs> about cars. Parents took me to the Philadelphia Auto Show at age eight, and as we walked in, there's this great concept car there. And when I saw that thing, I mean, you know, I m remember like it was last week. Mm -hmm. My mother on my right, my father on my left. And there it was, the Cadillac concept car. And I said, when I grow up, I want to be a designer for that company. Wow, wow. And so when you started working at General Motors, Motors, Motors in the early 70s as an intern and then finally getting on board in 1972, talk about some career highlights and different points of engagement that you believe defined your career and helped you get to where you are. Yeah, first I'd have to give a lot of credit to Howard University. I was in the College of Fine Arts studying both design and sculpture because mm -hmm. I feel as though Automobiles are very sculptural objects and you need to have that background. Right. So then I did an internship with GM and finished up my senior year and then I was there at, off to GM and the big leagues and uh, these guys are really, really good. Uh, some of the key moments would have been, you know, at the end of my first year uh, doing some Buick Riviera concepts for Bill Mitchell, who's the head of design then, mm -hmm. and then the progression through design studios. There was a point though where I developed a uh, high-speed research car. Mm -hmm. And for me that was the big, it was a big step for me because not only was I sketching, but I was managing the project. Mm -hmm. And I learned the value of collaboration, bringing people from different disciplines together to create something great. Ah, so when you bring different people together, I'm sure that there's some moments where you have to kind of step outside of your comfort zone, right? If you had some young designers listening to your story, how would you talk about that part, the comfort zone piece? Yeah, uh, you know, that, that's something that I love to talk about, you know, getting out of your comfort zone, whether it, it's the designer of the project or who you're working with or where you're working. You know, I. I spent a year in Germany at our studios there. Mm -hmm. Talk about being out of my comfort zone initially. Right. It ended up being a very rewarding experience. I say the same for other projects I've been involved in that seem very challenging or out of my comfort zone. 
Yeah. They were some of the most rewarding projects that I've been involved in. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure without stepping out of those comfort zones, you probably wouldn't have had the trajectory to get to where you are today. Well, exactly. I, I, I wouldn't have gone into design probably. Right, right. So speaking of design, tell us very briefly, what goes into designing a car? What, what does that look like? What does it feel like? It's a big subject, uh, but really it's creating creating great design, you need a strong vision, a clear vision for wow. what you want to do up front. And then you need to get that collaboration that I learned very early in my career between design and engineering. Once you have that in place, that foundation, I think you can do great things. And it's, you know, you go through the sketch project and gradually develop into full-size clay models and mm. finished models and, and you're having market research, you know, you, that uh, dialogue with customers is very important. Right, because if important. you have to know who you're designing for because a lot of people say if you design for everyone, you design for no one, right? Well, that's, yeah, that's true. <laughs> and, and if you design for yourself, you're just designing it for <laughs> one person. Yeah. yeah, so, but you know what? Coming back to you, you know, when I think about the things that I read about your career, which is amazing, the first thing that comes to mind to me is I wonder what type of challenges he faced along his professional journey? What were some of the roadblocks and how did you overcome those things? Because I'm sure it wasn't just a one track. You probably had a lot of bumps and. Well, you know, it's, you know, I think a lot of people probably think, you know, those challenges were from an ethnic perspective and, and that's true. But mm -hmm. I think the first challenge, because I had this mission from childhood mm -hmm. and march all the way through school, you know, middle school, high school, went to a great high school. Mm -hmm but it did not really prepare me for a career in design. Ah. And so when it was time to get into a college, mm -hmm. I got one rejection after another, another. Wow. in design schools. Howard University accepted me, and it was a terrific experience that I had at that school. Historically black college, right? So, you know, a lot of people really focus on the fact that you're the first African American to be the chief global designer, right, for a major auto uh, company. Uh, talk a little bit about what that means to you and how others can follow in that path and maybe learn some lessons from you being a pioneer and trailblazer and what could they do? It's, uh, I'd have to say that, you know, when I first started work at GM, mm -hmm. and I was the first African American uh, that General Motors had hired to design cars, mm -hmm. and did not know that until I started work, and I quickly realized that I was representing more than myself, mm. and I, I just wanted to design cars, you know, and you know right. my life dream was it was there, and right. it was part of, but. Um, I was representing more than myself because, mm -hmm. you know, every time you do a sketch, you sign it, it goes up on display, and everyone knows who did it, and everyone's interested in seeing it. What can this guy do? Yeah. And, and every step along the way, you know, I was the first chief designer. Right, right. That was African American. So, you know, and supervising a team of designers so people were interested in, in that. But, you know, I welcome that challenge. So whether it's uh, African-American or any other background, right, it, it matters about the work. And if you're strong in what you do, right, that that should stand above. But specifically to young African-Americans, right, what if career advice would you give them? Well, it's, you, you can't just dream mm -hmm. about being a designer or a doctor or, you know, NFL athlete. I mean, you've got to commit, you've got to work hard. Mm. You've got to work hard, you've got to push hard, you've got to research, you've got to contact people who are in that profession and ask advice. You know, I wrote my first letter to GM when I was 11. Wow. Wow. I wrote GM Design, wanted to know what did I need to do? Mm -hmm. What kind of classes do I need, did I need to take? What kind of schools do I need to go to? And they sent me great information. Right. And I just followed their lead. Yeah, you know, and that's good, you know, and I, and I think that one of the things of having people who are very accomplished and subject matter experts in industries is that a lot of people forget that they have other disciplines and non-negotiables and values that can translate anywhere. What are some of those things for Ed, even if you're not talking about design, yeah. very clear values and non-negotiables? You know, I, as I think about it, what's most important to me is 
how I treat the people who work with me mm -hmm. and work for me. In many ways, I consider them to be people who work with me. Right. And I treat them as individuals. They're close to 3,000 people that report to me. Mm -hmm. And I treat them all as individuals. Right. And I really care about their well-being and want to have an organization in which they feel free to create and bring forward their great ideas. Wow. Now that sounds like a true definition of leadership. And you know, um, being recognized as a, a global leader uh, is one thing, but having recognition in Detroit. You know, this year the Detroit Free Press honored you with its first automotive yeah. difference maker lifetime achievement award. You know, how did that make you feel professionally and personally? Tell us about that. I was very proud to get it, felt very humbled, kind of stunned in some ways. Uh, and it felt good, you know, because mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I feel as though I received it. I represent, like I said, 3,000 people, not all in Detroit. They're all over the world. We mm -hmm. have 10 studios around right. the world. Right. And to lead them and have them work together as one superpower design organization is really kind of cool. Well, we appreciate you here in Detroit. Um, but on the flip side of that, it's another thing to also be recognized by your peers. And so we know that GM rededicated uh, its Center for American Art, right, in your honor at the Detroit Institute of Arts. Tell us a little bit about that and, and, and how that ties into your legacy, right? I'm still stunned. <laughs> I, am. I, I had no warning, none at all, not until the moment that I'm standing there in that wing with Mary Barr and the rest of the leaders of GM when they told me, you know, and I was stunned. Yeah. And then as I looked around the room and I saw a painting created by my instructor at wow. Howard University. It doesn't get much more emotional than that. That's it still does as I think of that moment. That's, That's pretty awesome. Cool. You know, um, and, and I really like the authentic response to that because we didn't want the academic response. And so let's have a little fun now. I think we know a little bit about Ed and people can read up about you, but when I think about cars and I think about the man who's responsible for putting so many concepts and things on the road, you know, we, we, we say, well, what's his favorite car? Which one really gets you going? Which one do you want to ride off into the sunset in? It's, <laughs> there's so many cars that I love, but I, I'd have to say Corvette Stingray, 1963, Corvette Stingray split window coupe. Wow. That is it. What that color and it. why? Uh, ooh, silver with a red leather interior. That car had an influence on not only that whole generation of Chevrolets. You look at every other Chevrolet mm -hmm. that came right after that. They had a lot of that feel. But every Corvette since then has been inspired by that car. I like that. So we got about a minute left. And, you know, 44 years, right? Still look good, man. And you're retiring July 1st. You know, and a lot of people want to know, what's next for Ed? And how does that matter to Detroit and the rest of the world? Yeah, I, I feel as though uh, I have many more races to run, um, a lot more to do. I have uh, formed the Wellburn Group. And through that, I'll do some consulting on a number of projects. I will be working with uh, design schools. Mm. Uh, I have a book project that I'm working on, and I'll continue to consult with General Motors. We have a massive project designing an all-new design center, and I'm working very close with the architect, and we'll continue to do that. That's awesome. We appreciate you for being on American Black Journal, and it was a pleasure, Ed. Oh, it's great. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, we send our best wishes to Ed Welburn as he starts the next chapter of his life. Coming up next on American Black Journal, a major move for the Detroit Veterans Center. But first, here's a look at some important moments in Detroit's black history. I'm Ken Coleman with a look back at African-American life in Detroit. This week in 1945, Gladys Horton was born. She was a member of the Motown Records recording group, The Marvelettes.
1962, Arthur Prysock opened an engagement at the 20 grand. And in 1946, Robert Bradby Sr., pastor of Second Baptist Church, died at age 69. These are significant events this week in Detroit's black history, taken from the book On This Day, African American Life in Detroit. As the nation prepares to honor our fallen military heroes, the Michigan Veterans Foundation is preparing to build its future home. A groundbreaking ceremony takes place on Memorial Day for the new Detroit Veterans Center on Grand River at Forest. Since 1989, the Michigan Veterans Foundation has helped thousands of homeless veterans get back on their feet at its current location in the Cass Quarter. Joining me now is the executive director of the Michigan Veterans Foundation, Tyrone Chapman, along with U.S. Army veterans Reginald Harvey and Henry Madalonic. Welcome to American Black Journal. Thank you. Yeah. Good to be here. So there is something really heartbreaking about that phrase, homeless veteran, but that's a very real dynamic uh, in our community, and your work, of course, is focused on dealing with that issue when it comes up. Yes, sir, it is. Yeah, it's uh, hard for me to use those two words in the same sentence as well mm -hmm. uh, because most people hear that homeless veterans and we want them to understand that they are veterans first who just happen to uh, be homeless. But that's the mission of the Michigan uh, Veterans Foundation, to take care of the men and women who have taken care of this great nation and to see to it that those of us who are fortunate enough to make it home are uh, provided with the kind of services that are appropriate to help us make that transition uh, from being a soldier to uh, becoming a civilian yeah. all over again. Yeah, and, and I know that a lot of times when you're talking about uh, veterans who become homeless, there are some special issues that, that are really different from uh, the homeless population who, who, who did not serve. Absolutely. Well, especially when you factor in issues like post-traumatic stress disorder, yeah. traumatic right. brain injury, and the fact that for those veterans who have been in the combat situations, the rigors of combat and the rigors of being in the military are such that the transition is not easily made. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but for us at the foundation, it's a no-brainer. We're going to take care of those who've taken care of this great nation. So we've been around <coughs> since 1989 doing what it is that we are doing. A group of us Vietnam veterans all got together and realized that we needed to take care of each other. And, and so uh, the foundation was eventually formed. And so... We've evolved into this uh, major group as we are today, where not only do we do the transitional housing for the troops, we have a vet rescue program. So if a soldier is homeless for whatever reason, maybe burned out, evicted perhaps, or coming out of a long-term hospital stay, yeah. had no friends or relatives to pay their rent or mortgage, and so they come to us and we take care of them. We also have a veteran service center where we can do benefits explanations, claims filing, tracking follow-up. And our newest mission is phase one of our all veterans village on the east side of Detroit where yeah. we've got about five houses in the Connor Creek um, subdivision and we rehab those homes in collaboration with Habitat for Humanity Detroit uh, along with uh, Bank of America. And so uh, Mr. Metlonic and, and Mr. Um, Harvey are both uh, residents in yeah. one of those homes. Yeah, talk about uh, talk about the journeys that the two of you have been on from the service uh, to these these homes over on the east side. I'll start with you. Well, uh, it's been a epic journey for me personally. Uh, I had a health issue uh, three years ago, and I knew I had to leave my apartment on the west side to get to proximity of the VA hospital because mm -hmm. I was diagnosed with uh, prostate cancer and I knew I had to go for treatment for 12 weeks every day. Wow. So uh, so you needed to be closer by? I needed to be closer by in the Detroit Vet Veterans Center at Park Avenue and Temple where it is now provided that stability for me. Yeah. Yeah. So to make a long story short, <laughs> I am cancer free today. Oh wow, that's wow. outstanding. Right. Yeah, right. So I, I mean, this made a big difference. It makes a big, big difference, you. and uh, if it wasn't for the Detroit Veterans Center, I don't think I would have been able to uh, get these treat yeah. treatments on a daily basis yeah. because I lived way on the west side. Uh, Joy Road in Southfield. Yeah. So, I mean, it would have been, you would have and, been a, either a long bus and, ride and, and or... And personally, I don't have a car. Yeah. I don't want a car yeah. by choice. <laughs> uh, and the Greenpeace people love me. 
Because yeah. <laughs> I ride a bike. Your carbon footprint's very I, I, small. I, I, right? I ride. A, I ride. I have a. I have a elaborate bike. Yeah. I have a Schwinn, yeah. best bike I ever rode, <laughs> and I ride that bike 365 days a year. Yeah. And yeah. so that uh, my. Uh, which couldn't have ridden the bike from Joy and Southfield all the way no. down. No, my personal physician uh, said that that my bike riding and my walking the dog probably had a lot to do with my recovery. Yeah, uh, being uh, it's good, so quickly to, to, to sort of bounce yes, back. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Harvey, talk about uh, your story. My story started <clears throat> from my Luther King High School. I was in ROTC. I was a second lieutenant when I graduated, and my father was a Korean veteran. Um, so I knew all the time I had military influence. My dad was always talking about going to the military. It's nine of us. Yeah, wow. And I used to wonder why my dad never named none of us middle names. He said that would have been 18 of us. <laughs> so he never gave us middle names. He says, yeah. enough keeping up with you guys' name. So he told me to go into ROTC and um, you go in the military with two stripes ahead of the next guy. So I went into military as a corporal. And uh, a corporal is a non-commissioned officer. Sure. Um, which be like a platoon leader, yeah. and that's what I was. And um, I started off at Fort, um, Fort Knox, Kentucky. Uh -huh. I did my basic, I did my AIT, Advanced Individual Training at Fort Dix, New Jersey, uh -huh. on the East Coast. And I went to um, Fort Bragg, North Carolina for the 82nd Airborne, then I went on to Ranger School to Fort Gordon. So um, I had, um, uh, special ops training when you're going off into Ranger sure. and Airborne, but you uh, have to make jumps, so many jumps. Right, right, right. To be airborne. Yeah. And, uh, and talk about the tr the trouble that you've sort of run into. Okay, the trouble that. that I ran into was my house caught a fire, and I got burnt out. Yeah. And I didn't even know anything about the Michigan Veterans Foundation, but I wound up when I got uh, burnt out. I had to go to the I was, they said, you're a veteran, we'll take you to the VA hospital. So yeah. I was like, okay. So I wind up going to the VA hospital. It used to be in Allen Park um, off of Southfield. So I went there, and then that's when they started telling me about different programs that you can get involved in. Then they started telling me about, you know, that you can get, um, a, you know, you can, you can file for non-service connection or service connection. Yeah. And I wind up getting my disability for post-traumatic stress disorder. PTSD, yeah, yeah, which a lot of guys come which home. Which a lot of guys, uh, right? Come and home. I was in Cambodia and Laos, yeah. right. on the other side of Vietnam. Right, right. So, yeah. uh, what 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 I hear in both of these stories is both short term and long term need, and I would imagine that that's pretty common. Absolutely, it is. Doing. You know, for us, um, in our early days, as we were providing services, it wasn't long before we realized that we needed to really expand on what it is that we were doing because we were having a tremendous challenge trying to find housing uh, for these veterans. And one of the things that we really were against, we didn't want to put them in an apartment building or some building where people drive by and go, oh, all those vets are there. Sure. These vets came from communities and neighborhoods and so we wanted to reintegrate them back into uh, the neighborhood and help in our own small way um, be a part of the renaissance of uh, Detroit yeah. and so that's why we targeted that uh, east side of Detroit that had been long neglected and, and abandoned, with light and abandoned of, uh, pretty left much. There, yeah. yeah and, and intimidating uh, but bringing the, the soldiers in we're sure. not easily <laughs> intimidated right. Uh, we are a real asset. We want the community to know that if you need us, yeah. please call on us. We just changed all the flags at all our homes. We have the colors flying. <laughs> we have our logo. Uh, so we want the public to know that we are an asset in your neighborhood, in your community. Even the youth, we want them to view us as um, a safe haven right. Uh, right. kind of a thing for themselves if they're right. confronted with something yeah. that makes them very uncomfortable. And then lastly, uh, we've targeted a building uh, that we want to acquire, rehab, and convert into a youth enrichment center, have veterans there as mentors. We've got some Eastern Michigan University and some other institutions on board who says, listen, we're going to help you out. Yeah. Come in, help these children make some positive life choices. We're going to serve one nutritionally balanced meal a day wow. uh, and see to it that 
these kids get what they need because ultimately they're going to be yeah, our future. Yeah. We've, we've got about 30 seconds left to talk about the groundbreaking on Memorial Day. Opportune time for yes, this, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> You know, it's been long in the making. It's been a <laughs> tre tremendous road to traverse, to say the least. Mm -hmm. For a while, it was like climbing a slippery slope. However, we've prevailed. We're excited. We're building a facility that we call the Pentagon. Oh, well, there you go. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so there will be a Pentagon in Detroit. It will be there. So we're excited about that. We're going to uh, take on some new challenges. And the neighborhood that we are in, we want to make certain that they understand that we are there to partner. Yeah. We want to integrate into the community. We're not just a bunch of veterans you who are imposing part their of that will. That's right. So if there are things that you guys want to do, community patrol, anything you can think of after school recreation for the youth because we will have a yeah. gymnasium yeah. and we will still be serving a nutritionally balanced meal once a day for youth in that, community, in that community who live at yeah. or below the poverty yeah. level yeah. so right. we're excited the men are excited yeah. We're chomping at the bit to get in there. And <laughs> That's right. Monday is our day. Happen. We're All rolling right. out the flag, yeah. the colors, the vehicles, okay. fly over the whole nine yards. All right. All right. Well, congratulations on the new thank site. Uh, and thank you for being here on American Black Journal. Appreciate thank the you. invitation. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. That's our program for today. Thanks for watching. You can get more information about our guests at AmericanBlackJournal.org. And you can connect with us on Facebook and on Twitter. And you can hear our program on WDET 1019 FM. We'll see you next time. American Black Journal is funded by the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, a partner with communities where children come first. At DTE Energy, we believe that we have a greater responsibility. We believe that being part of a community means being involved in the fabric of that community, investing time, effort, and resources in the communities we serve. DTE Energy Foundation is a proud sponsor of American Black Journal.